Hi everyone, Pastor Graham here and welcome to Church at Home with Northbourne Baptist. Here I am in the church foyer and it's bathed in sunshine because it's the beginning of spring, the start of spring. The long winter is over and in Melbourne, I think perhaps we've had the longest winter in our history. We've endured uh, six weeks of stage four lockdown and we're fighting for the lives of the, particularly the elderly and the vulnerable. But now it's spring and hope is in the air. The infection numbers are slowly starting to come down. And in a couple of weeks' time, we hope to be out of stage four. But the real hope is not found in our circumstances. The real hope is something that happens here. The real hope of life is in our hearts. And it's stirred by the presence of Jesus, the saving, powerful grace of Jesus that overcomes even the darkest of winters. The Apostle Paul's prayer is one that I really want to pray for you and I today. And it goes like this from Ephesians 1 verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather in homes today, we gather as one people, united together around the hope of Jesus Christ. I pray that the hope of Jesus will permeate not just in our homes and our lives, but throughout this community and throughout the world. In these troubled times, may Jesus, the name of Jesus, be the hope of the world. Lord, as we worship together and study around your word and fellowship, we pray that your presence and your hope be real and powerful uh, in every way in our lives as we meet together. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe that people matter. I believe everyone deserves the chance to be free. I am just one person. I am just one person. I'm just one person. We are many. We are students. We are lawyers. We are surfers. We are farmers. We live in major cities. In tiny rural towns. We have different cultures. Different lifestyles. Different hairstyles. Different voices. And we are free. 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 We use our freedom to play. To fight. To raise our voice. For those who aren't yet free. We believe that when we play, those who were slaves will be set free. We are relentless. We are determined. We will stand together and fight until all are free. We are an everyday, ordinary, ragtag, table tennis Um, We are Hong United. United. We have operations all over the world, rescuing people from slavery. Because today there are criminals who abuse children, sell girls. How old is she? 12. 12? How much? 30? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. And force families into slavery. 
criminals prey on the easiest target, the world's poor, because they expect no one to defend them. Pareho po tayong mga tao, hindi po tayo ipagay or hayo na pwedeng gamitin lang sa pansarili. But today, there are thousands of people gathering to seek justice for those in slavery. We are a group of lawyers, counselors, activists, and supporters. We are called International Justice Mission. And together, we form the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. But slavery won't come to an end until criminals know they can't get away with it. So we partner with local police to arrest and prosecute criminals. This sends a message to slave owners. We will not go away. We stay with the survivors until they are healed, until they are free. Natulungan po ako ng IJM sa pamigitan po na sa case ko, sa pagtulong po nila na ma-overcome ko po yung, yung fear. Each year, we rescue thousands of slaves and protect millions around the world. We are transforming how justice systems protect their citizens. Hi everyone, Pastor Graham here. Here at Northbourne Baptist, we have a vision to be a church for people of all nationalities and languages. The words of Jesus that are outside our worship auditorium say that we're to be a house of prayer for all nations. A really important part of this ministry has been our, uh, our Chinese pastor, Dr. Tony Wong. Now he's been doing a fantastic job of building up a team and growing the Chinese ministry over the last few years. We've seen baptisms and new members. We've seen a large increase in families, uh, in children and youth ministry during this time. And as Tony finishes his role soon, we need to form a search team to find the right person to continue this great work. And I'd like to introduce you to the team today. Hi everyone, my name is Pamela. Just wanted to share that um, God does have a plan for multicultural diversity uh, in his church. We can see that from the beginning in Genesis that he has said that he will bless people of all nations. Or in Revelation, we see uh, people of all tribes and language come together. And Jesus also uh, asks us to reach out to make disciples of all nations. Therefore, it is with this in mind that uh, we strive to uphold uh, MBBC's Chinese ministry with a vision to embrace multicultural ethnicity, especially from China and Southeast Asia. So please pray with us as we search for the right pastor for our church to embrace this important journey. Thank you. My name is Michael Lee, and I am a deacon at MBBC. We were informed that Pastor Tony will be resigning from the role of associate pastor at MBBC. He's going to take up a full-time position in a Bible college in Sydney. The search team had a meeting last week and had agreed on the new pastor's responsibilities. will be to continue to lead and grow the Chinese community, equip and empower the members to reach out to the mainly Mandarin-speaking people in the community, and to a lesser extent, the Cantonese Chinese community as well. I'm Siu Li and have been part of the Chinese ministry leadership team. The pastoral search team really appreciates the ongoing encouragement and support of the Chinese ministry by the entire congregation at NBBC. We pray that God will bring us the right pastor with, that will fit well into our church culture and also bring new energy into this ministry. We are excited in embarking on this journey. Please continue to pray for God's will in this ministry. Hi, my name is Selena. I'm one of the worship leaders here in MBBC. Although we're in a pandemic with a lot of uncertainties around, but God's work is still happening in this very special way. God has given the MBBC family a Chinese ministry. Let us follow his lead. 
Go and make disciples of all nations. Let his light continue to shine in North Bowen. Our Chinese ministry is still happening. It is still having its fortnightly Bible study class, maintaining its digital presence. Arthur Bai has been appointed as the coordinator of this ministry until the new pastor comes on board. Hi, 各位弟兄姊妹好，我是 Arthur Bai。作为 NBBC 中文小组的协调人，在新的中文牧师到来之前，我将与教会里面的领导者一起去做沟通，帮助我们小组的成长。在 NBBC 去支撑周围，无论是说各种语言的、来自不同国度的，或者是不同肤色、不同民族的人，是我们的一个重要支点。那。中文小组作为一个新的小组来说，我们迫切需要，而且持续需要进行有合适的人对我们进行牧养。那教会的支持也是其中最重要的一点。希望在不远的将来，中文小组能成为教会增长的一级。我们正在寻求合适的牧师来领导和壮大中文小组。当然，我们永远祈祷去得到上帝的指导和上帝的智慧。那同时，教会里面的弟兄姊妹的支持也是我们向前的力量。多谢你们，谢谢。Hi, my name is Shirley, and I'm the deacon for Multicultural Ministry. I'm very excited that we've commenced the search for a pastor to lead. Our Chinese-speaking congregation, we appreciate your continued support and commitment to this ministry. Now, you may ask, how can you help? Tell your family and friends that we are looking for a pastor. Details of the job description will be posted on our website. Pray for the search team. Continue to encourage our Chinese ministry leaders and church members. The current lockdown situation does make the search a little tricky. But I know God will provide someone suitable for the role. Please pray with us as we undertake to find the right person to lead this ministry into the future. Let us pray. We pray for the older and bigger kids, the exams and their schools. We pray for the kid, not only the kids but also the people of Melbourne as they come into the extended lockdown. They feel more frustrated. They feel more unfair. But Father Lord, we hope that this lockdown will bear much fruit for the、um, for the、uh, recovery of this state. Lord. Father Lord, we look forward to the time when we can meet again、uh, as, as as a church. But we, during this time, Lord, we ask for、uh, vigilance. We ask for wisdom, and we ask for endurance to, during this time. And Father Lord, we thank you for the lovely, warmer spring weather that we're receiving. We hope that the better weather, the better scenery, the springtime flowers can help to lift everyone's spirits up, and so everyone will be more cheerful. And as we say goodbye to winter, we also hope that we can welcome a better season for everyone after the lockdown. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning. My name is Lauren, and I'm a deacon here at Northbourne Baptist Church. This morning, I'm going to be doing the reading from Mark chapter fourteen, verses twenty-seven to thirty-one, and Mark chapter fourteen, verses seventy to seventy-two. I'm reading from the、uh, New International Version. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, "Even if all fall away, I will not." Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, "Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times." But Peter insisted emphatically. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. After a while, 
Those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, he will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the reading of the Lord. Pastor Graham here. Here's a question for you today. What do you do with your failures? Now, failures can come in many different forms. There can be moral failures. I don't know how many times I've said to myself, why on earth did you do that, Graham? Or spiritual failure, perhaps, when we become apathetic and uncommitted to our faith. Sometimes we have a, a failure of courage. Maybe at work or with friends, we, we deliberately downplay our Christianity or, or we hide our Christian faith from others in case they don't approve. But I want to put your mind at rest. We all fail. I fail. We're all in this together, which is the common phrase these days. And you will fail. But this story, this event of Jesus, helps us to understand what God thinks of us in failure and what happens next. In Mark chapter 14, in the passage we're looking at today, Jesus and his disciples are at a really critical time. It's just before Jesus is about to be arrested and tried and crucified on the cross. And so Jesus has gathered his disciples around him. And the first thing we learn in this passage, in this story, is that Peter fails to understand himself. In verse 27, Jesus says to his gathered disciples, he says, you will all fall away. He's, Jesus told them this and, and he says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So Jesus knew that all of them would fail him. He was working with 12 duds. <laughs> So Jesus wasn't caught by surprise. He didn't have high expectations uh, that were unreasonable. Jesus knew the frailty of humanity and he knew that his disciples would fail him. Peter, however, did not know this. <laughs> In verse 29, we read that Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Peter was full of bravado, full of self-confidence and self-pride. But Peter was totally unaware of how vulnerable he was to the challenges and temptations that lay ahead in life. It's interesting that in Luke's account, he adds a very important detail. In verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen the brothers. So Peter was way too overconfident in himself, totally unaware, really, at the peril and difficulty he was in. And Peter turns to Jesus in verse 29 of Mark 14 and says, even if everyone else will fall away, I won't. Peter had elevated his faith above everyone else. Even if all of the rest of this mob fall off, I won't. But we know the scripture teaches us that pride comes before a fall. Or as one author put it, he says, pride is like bad breath. Everyone knows you have it except you. <laughs> but this is how so many of us fail too. We too fail to understand we're in a spiritual war. Satan is throwing everything at us to derail our faith and our witness, and we're too busy comparing ourselves to others. Jesus told the, Paris, uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the tax collector's praying in the temple, I thank God that I'm not like other people. The safest person is the one who is aware of all the dangers around him. And Peter was not. The second failure in this story is Peter's personal failure. So Peter makes this grand statement, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and even to death. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today 
Yes, tonight even, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter is not to be denied. In verse 31, he says, even if I have to die with you, I would never disown you. And of course, all the rest of the disciples chimed in and said the same thing. Now, at this point in time, having heard what Peter said, you would think it would take an awful lot to break Peter, wouldn't it? I mean, maybe it would take torture, some sort of torture method, maybe a threat of death, or maybe having to stand before the Sanhedrin or, the, or stand before King Herod. But we know from the story that all it takes is the inquiry of a lowly servant girl. In verse 40, uh, 66, it says, While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, Weren't you with that Nazarene Jesus? But he denied it. I, I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the ter uh, entrance. I mean, isn't that often the case with us, though, at times too? I mean, we feel full of faith and bravado with the Lord at times. We hear a good sermon. We get all stirred up. We read a good book. We have a, a spiritual high and we make all the promises and commitments to the Lord and then we go to work the next day and we're afraid and hide away our faith. So a second time, Peter is confronted. Verse 69, when the servant girl, girl saw him again, she said, to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. But again, he denied knowing Jesus. And of course, a third time, after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. And he began to call down curses and he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. And he denied Jesus three times, just as Jesus predicted him. He's become so concerned about his self-preservation, he descends into crudities. And as the cock crows for the second time, Peter remembers and breaks down in tears over his failure. And I think that's a good place to be, isn't it? That's where we all need to be too, that we need to break down in tears over our failures because then we're in the right place. But it wasn't just Peter who failed. Jesus, after all, said, all of you will fail. So before we come down too hard on just Peter, let's just have a, a look further into the story and we see that they all failed Jesus. So just before his arrest, Jesus takes his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And so in verse 32, it says, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. So Jesus has desperately appealed to them to stand with him and stay with him and, and keep watch on the, uh, in the night. And in verse 37, it says that when Jesus returned he, to his disciples, he found them asleep. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Okay, that's strike one. Everybody makes a mistake. Everyone has a bad moment. So you surely think Peter and the disciples would learn from that. But uh, Jesus says to them to watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. And he goes off a second time to pray. But in verse 39, it tells us that once more he went away and prayed and when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And Jesus confronted them again. And this time they did not know what to say to him. What could you say? <laughs> the first time could be a mistake. The second time is really ne negligent. And a third time Jesus goes away to pray. <clears throat> and returning a third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? <laughs> Strike three. And it's interesting that Peter denies Jesus three times. And here the disciples abandon Jesus and, and are not alert and not praying in this time. Three times. And Jesus says, enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of sinners. 
and Jesus is arrested and taken away. So the instructions he gave to his disciples were to keep watch, to watch and pray, but they just fell asleep. They deserted Jesus in his hour of need. They totally failed him. They totally missed the urgency of the hour and the need for the power of heaven. How often do we do the same? How often around us is this great need for people to pray and to seek the Lord and to speak the truth of God and stand up for the Lord and we too drift off into the background asleep. And that's a great challenge to us, isn't it? To be alert and to live our lives deliberately in his kingdom. Now, you're probably thinking, thanks, Graham, for pointing out all those failures. <laughs> Just what we needed on a day like this. But in this story, something amazing happens in the middle of the story that, that is so empowering. I, I, I just want you to be able to see it, that there's great grace in the middle of their failure. In verse 27, Jesus says, you'll all fall away. But in verse 28, he says, but after I have risen, I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. Now, Peter probably totally missed hearing this. Um, Peter jumped into a self-defense and a, a bravado about what he would do. But Jesus was saying, Jesus was saying that every one of you is going to fail me but I will see you in Galilee afterwards. So Jesus is making plans to be with them after their failure. That's really important. I want you to think about that for a minute, that even before they failed, Jesus is already making plans to be with them afterwards. In Luke's version, verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon. That, you, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So once again, Jesus is making plans after their failure. So their failure was not the end for Jesus, but part of a journey of growth and maturity. So Jesus is about to die on the cross for their sins and their failures. He's about to rise again and breathe the Holy Spirit into their lives. And a great transformation happens over the disciples. Uh, Peter would go on to be the rock in which Christ would build his church in Jerusalem. All the disciples, uh, bar John, would indeed become martyrs for them. They would die for Jesus. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, he would seek them out and he would forgive them. He would restore them and recommission them as disciples and followers of him. And so too it is with you and I that our failures hit us right in the face at times. But Jesus has plans for us beyond our failures. So I've failed so many times over the years and failure brings this swamping of shame and guilt. And I want you to know that if you blew it last night or if you blew it two weeks ago, or if you blew it 10 years ago, there's room at the foot of the cross for you. The invitation is for us to come to Jesus, to confess and repent our sins and be forgiven and healed and restored and renewed. So there's a, a, a few things I want us to remember as we close today. The first thing is failure is not the end. That when we fail, we're not put away in a corner and discarded into the discard pile. I mean, do you ever feel that way, that you may have failed one too many times and God has probably wiped the floor with you and moved on? Failure is not the end. The second thing is, the grace of God is way more thorough than you could ever imagine. Jesus has taken your sin and, his, and your failure upon himself on the cross and God is looking for a reason to cast... God is not looking for a reason to cast you aside... He's offering you a second chance, even today. The third thing is, in your failure, Jesus is praying for you. Now, this is a stunning statement from Jesus to Peter, isn't it? But I have prayed for you. And Jesus is praying for you. He's calling down the power of heaven for you. 
That's really important to remember in our failures. Jesus has already made plans to meet you on the other side of failure. Jesus is the risen Lord. He's the Lord who brings hope and renewal and transformation. And his purpose for your life is waiting for you on the other side of failure. The fifth thing is watch, pray, be alert and be diligent and live diligently. The best way to avoid failure before it even happens is to be self-aware of the environment we're in, the temptations and the difficulties and the spiritual dangers that are around us. We need to be prayerful and watchful that our lives follow his way and rely on the power of heaven to keep us near to God. The last thing I wanted to say was, you might have a friend or a family member who's failed. Don't give up on them. Jesus hasn't. Point them towards Jesus who's waiting on the other side of failure to embrace and reward and forgive and restore. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Praise him. Father God, we stand before you as people who fail. Lord, we've failed in so many different ways, but we come back to you because we know of your amazing grace. Lord, cleanse us and renew us and forgive our sin. And Lord, restore us and send us on our way anew and afresh in you. And Lord, when we do fail, Lord, help us not to hide from you, but to come openly before you and confess before you uh, that we might be restored into your way. We thank you and praise you for this beautiful gift of grace in the midst of a story of failure. In Jesus' name, amen.